Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for being here today. It's really a pleasure to have been invited to give this lecture by Don. So thank you, Don. Um, hopefully this is not too sciencey, too data heavy. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what the background of the audience was going to be. So there is there is a bit of data here, but I'm I've tried to um, make it as accessible as possible. So hopefully, if you have questions at the end, I'll be able to we'll have time for me to answer them. Um, so I thought I'd borrow the um, the illustrations from Lewis Carroll's uh, original sketches for the publication of a very famous book, Alice in Wonderland, which of course has an iconic scene where Alice is conversing with a caterpillar uh, here depicted from uh, Lewis Carroll's original sketch. And, and the caterpillar tells her to eat a mushroom. And you'll see a little bit more of that in a second. So this has been kind of a, an icon for um, the psychedelic community um, for quite a while. And, and I found these really cool um, old illustrations. So hopefully you enjoy them for, for their aesthetic value if nothing else. Oops, let's see here. Okay, so I thought I'd start out today by giving you a, a kind of a general timeline of human psilocybin symbiosis. Um, and if you don't know what psilocybin is, um, just I sh probably should explain, this is the psychoactive uh, agent of psychedelic mushrooms. And you'll hear a lot more about it in a minute. But um, there is some indication that humans may have had a long history of use of psilocybin containing mushrooms, although this is still quite debatable. So there are some rock art paintings from around 9,000 years ago that are arguably the oldest uh, uh, illustration, oldest evidence of use of hallucinogenic mushrooms by humans. The first real evidence comes from the 16th century when the Spaniards arrived in um, pre-Columbian Mexico uh, and well, it wasn't pre-Columbian at that point, but <laughs> encountered pre-Columbian cultures in Mexico. And this is a codex, one of several codexes that were brought back to Europe that depict ritualistic ingestion of uh, psychedelic mushrooms. And so this was the first time uh, that, that the knowledge of this was available to the Western world. And there was a famous friar, Sao Goon, uh, Spanish friar who identified these as what um, the Nahua, which is a group of people in southern Mexico, were calling Teo Nanaka. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing these right, but certainly not, um, which means God's flesh. And so that was the term that they gave to these psychedelic mushrooms. Now, this practice has been going on for thousands of years, likely before the arrival of the Spaniards, but there's no written documentation of it until the 16th century. However, it wasn't until the 20th century when scientists really kind of picked up from the early um, records of the Spanish and, it, and, and brought into light um, the actual scientific basis of this phenomenon. And the first uh, people were Reiko, an anthropologist, and then Richard Evans Schultes, uh, which is a name that might be familiar to you because, of course, he was a Harvard ethnobotanist. Uh, and they both identified um, Teona and Nako as psychoactive mushrooms in the genus Paniolus. Uh, however, they were wrong. And it wasn't until 1951 when Rolf Singer, a very famous mycologist, visited the Farlow and examined specimens collected by Reiko and Schultes that they had identified, misidentified as Paniolus, and identified them as Psilocybe cubensis. So he was the first to correctly identify them. Presumably these specimens still exist there, although they're not database. So Don would have to look for them and, and let me know. Um, and it wasn't until 1957, however, that uh, the knowledge of psychoactive mushrooms uh, became widely known. So up until this point, uh, this information was really known only by a handful of scientists and, and nobody else in the wider public. However, R. Gordon Wasson, another name that might be familiar to people uh, at Harvard, um, learned from Schultes about the mushrooms that he identified in Southern Mexico. And, and he led his own expedition there in uh, the 1950s and documented and partook, he was the first Westerner to partake in a personal account of ritualistic um, magic mushroom use. Uh, 
Um, and this was in Oaxaca. And he published this with photos like the one I'm showing here in an issue of Life magazine in 1957. And it was at that point then that the knowledge of psychoactive mushrooms became widely known and really was kind of the, the beginning of, oh, and, and the structure of psilocybin was determined at that time as well. And this really launched uh, what's now known as the psychedelic era, the 60s and early 70s. It was actually a short-lived era because it um, of one person in particular, Richard Nixon, who in 1971, um, declared a war on drugs and listed psilocybin and a bunch of other chemicals on the Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act. That means there's no approved medical use uh, for these compounds and they therefore are banned. And so this ended the psychedelic era as well as research on these kinds of drugs. And there upon we entered the era of ignorance. <laughs> now, um, today, there's sort of been a, a rapid shift in thinking and the research on this drug and the organisms that produce them is, is now becoming more acceptable by society. And, and so this has launched a whole new revolution of understanding of their importance. And in fact, uh, recent research is all pointing to the fact that psilocybin is an ex extraordinary effective therapy for a wide range of mental illnesses from depression, um, PTSD, and addiction, among other things. In fact, it's been shown that psilocybin is the most effective antidepressant ever known. So there's a lot of uh, evidence from the medical field, um, from a changing perceptions of society for the taboos surrounding psychedelic use that is really changing the scene and allowing more research to happen. And here's a recent article uh, from last year about um, how magic mushrooms could heal us. Again, the application for this wide range of mental health uh, illnesses. And this was spurred by a recent legislation that was passed in Oregon that actually legalized uh, magic mushrooms. So it's being decriminalized. Psilocybin is being decriminalized in a number of places, um, municipalities uh, around the US, uh, but Oregon recently legalized it, although the actual um, policy doesn't go into effect quite yet. Nonetheless, um, because of this loosening of uh, regulation, you can now purchase psilocybin products online. And here's an example of one pumpkin spice mushroom tea, if that sounds appealing to you, I don't know, uh, not, not to me, but maybe you prefer coconut cranberry mushroom chocolates. Um, this, is, uh, this is our future here. These are uh, available for sale and, and delivery in Vancouver. And one thing I, I'm gonna point out here with the circles is that these contain um, something called a golden teacher in different amounts. And I think this illustrates something that kind of was the motivation for a lot of this research, which is what even are these things? What are golden teachers? And what does it mean to consume half a gram or 1.1 grams of them? And it turns out we really don't know the answers to that. So golden teachers are a strain of this species of mushroom, Psilocybe cubensis, illustrated here in the middle. And I thought this was a good place to take some quotes from uh, Lewis Carroll's book, Alice in Wonderland, and this is the caterpillars talking to Alice and says, one side will make you grow taller and the other side will make you grow shorter. And she says, other, other side of what? And he said, well, the mushroom. And then she's looking at the mushroom and of course, mushroom caps are, are round. So now which is which? Which side is which? Which side's gonna make you grow shorter and which side's gonna make you grow taller? Well, she consumes them and grows short and then consumes the other side and grows tall and hopefully you know the rest of that story. But I think this encapsulates sort of the questions that still remain unanswered even in the real world about these organisms and their possible uh, uses for therapy and even recreation. So what are these things? Well, in general, most of them belong to the genus Psilocybe. This is in the broad sense, that's what the SL means, sensulato. Um, they are the largest group of mushrooms that naturally produce psilocybin. I'm going to tell you about a few others um, in a few slides, but this is the group, the core group that people think about and talk about mostly. 
when we're talking about psilocybin producing mushrooms. They are mostly pileate, stipitate, lamellate. What that means is they have a cap, they have a stalk, and they have gills underneath, like your typical mushroom from the grocery store. Um, LBMs, and LBM is a term that refers to little brown mushrooms, of which there are many, and of which uh, it's difficult to identify them in the field. So lots of things have this kind of little brown mushroom morphology, and it's very difficult to distinguish them. Um, one thing that does distinguish this group from others is that they have a purple-brown spore print. That is, if you take a cap and you put it on a piece of paper overnight and you lift it off, the spores will have deposited on that paper, and the color of those spores are purple-brown, and that is, uh, uh, that is characteristic of the genus. Interestingly, there is one odd morphology that's called Sicotioid. And it's only in one species that occurs in New Zealand, endemic to New Zealand. That's down here. It's like a regular mushroom, except that the cap never opens up. So it never exposes the gills and the spores to the outside environment. This uh, sicotioid form then has to disperse the spores by other means. And we think, um, and we have a research project on this currently, that is being dispersed by animals, possibly flightless birds. So stay tuned on that, and I can tell you more about that uh, maybe next year. Now, ecologically, this group are decomposers. So they live in the soil on wood and dung, uh, and many of them are, in fact, associated with disturbed areas, and so they may be pioneer spe species. There's been 277 to 326 species described. That range, of course, depends on who you talk to. But only 165 of those, so a just about half of them, have this characteristic bluing reaction. And that's when you handle the mushroom, it will turn a blue color. And that's important, and I'll explain that a little bit later on, what's going on there. It's thought that the bluing species are the ones that are psychoactive, and the non-bluing species are the ones that are not. Um, they are found throughout the world, but mostly in the temperate and tropical zones of the Americas. And that might have to do with uh, where the mycologists who study them uh, have lived. <laughs> and of course, uh, they have a long history of use. And this is um, depicted down here with this image, uh, this photo I took recently of a colleague's uh, personal collection of mushroom stones in Guatemala. Okay, so um, you're gonna see a lot of these uh, during my talk. These are phylogenetic trees. If you're not familiar with looking at them, they're like genealogies. You can think of them as family histories, the lines connecting two species indicate a relationship between them. So, um, but this is of course over evolutionary time as opposed to um, generations in your own family, but they're essentially the same thing. Uh, so there was a landmark study in 2002 that looked at all of the mushroom forming fungi using molecular phylogenetics um, for the first time really at this scale. And they found that these psilocybe mushrooms were polyphyletic. That meant that they had more than one ancestor. So that suggested that in fact, they weren't each other's closest relatives. And they were also divided between the bluing species and the non-bluing species. So that was the first clue that there might be some cryptic taxonomy that needs to be sorted out. And in fact, uh, they proposed the name, um, they proposed to conserve the name psilocybe for the psychoactive bluing species, even though the type of psilocybe in fact belonged with the non-bluing species that are now known as deconica. The reason for that is because of the history of um, psychoactive mushrooms in the scientific and popular literature. They wanted to preserve that information by designating the genus psilocybe for those hallucinogenic types. Okay, so of the 300 or so species traditionally classified as psilocybe, at the time, only 37 had been transferred over to Deconica, meaning there's still a lot of species that we don't know which group they belong to yet. Okay. I have a confession to make at this point, which is not anything related to Bill Clinton. 
Oops, how do I get this to work? There we go. Which is, I've actually only encountered these mushrooms nine times. <laughs> and here they are. These are the nine times I've ever encountered them in the wild. Um, so you might be wondering then, at why am I talking about them? What gives me expertise? And the answer is these people. <laughs> they are the ones that have done all the work and have the knowledge, taxonomic knowledge, um, that I am simply communicating to you. So I'm really the messenger here today. The main person that, that is responsible for all of this work is Alex Bradshaw, Dr. Bradshaw. He was my PhD student and uh, did a short postdoc with me, and he's the one that has generated all of the data. Um, two very close collaborators that are absolutely essential to the success of this project are Dr. Laura Guzman, the daughter of Gaston Guzman, who is the most famous psilocybe taxonomist uh, to date, and Dr. Uh, Virginia Ramirez Cruz, who is uh, uh, another researcher with uh, Lauda's lab. So these two are um, have, have the best knowledge of psilocybe presently, and so they are really critical to this study. Two other people that are involved are Juliana Furci, who's really helping with some of the communication part of the project. And I cannot fail to mention Paul Stamets here, um, a real visionary, and he has decided to fund this project. So it's thanks to Paul that we have the funding to do this work. But it wouldn't be possible without the institutions, because it is because of institutions like the Natural History Museum of Utah or the Farlow that has pr have preserved these specimens that makes it possible for me to do this work today. So these institutions are critically important to future research. We can't predict today what people might know about and be able to do in the future. And so if we can preserve these things, that makes it possible for new discoveries to happen. So these are just, this is what the collection looks like at the Natural History Museum of Utah. We are the custodians of this biodiversity heritage that is really the heritage for all of us. Um, and we try to keep them in as best condition as we can using climate control um, and, and uh, careful handling strategies. Okay, so we're now getting into some of the, the meat of the talk. I've divided it into three parts. The first part, I'm gonna tell you about authenticating um, fungarium specimens uh, using DNA sequencing. And then we're all, we also examined some of the preservation of the chemistry in these specimens. The second part, I'm going to talk to you about uh, phylogenomics. This is building evolutionary trees using whole genomes. And then that allows us to ask other questions about these organisms. And in this case, we are particularly interested in the evolution of the genetic basis of psilocybin biosynthesis. So I'll tell you a bit about that. And then I'm going to switch gears a little bit in the third part, and I'm going to speculate a little bit on the functional role of this drug in nature. Okay, so first part. So when we set out to do this project, um, we first had to solicit specimens because um, my nine encounters didn't really provide enough uh, data points to work with. And so we um, spent some time, Alex spent some time, it just happened to <laughs> coincide with the lockdown during the pandemic. And so this was the perfect project for him to, to get working on. And we then um, built a database out of uh, all of the data digitized records on MycoPortal. And this is a central um, repository that uh, attempts to collate all of the digital records of fungal specimens uh, in North America, and they've been expanding uh, worldwide more recently. So we went in and we queried for all psilocybe specimens. And then we had to build a database because we had to correct some of the names because many specimens were still um, registered under old names. So after we did all of this, um, we contacted 72 institutions, um, totaling almost 4,000 specimens of psilocybe that had been collected over 139 years. And this is an average of 26 samples a year. So this, I think, really illustrates the importance of collections because if we were try we if we were to do this work um, ourselves at a rate of 26 samples a year, it would take us many, many years to get the material we needed to make anything meaningful out of this. 
Uh, in the end, we received 1,600 uh, specimens. Some institutions were reluctant to loan them due to concerns over regulation of the controlled wood substance that they may contain. Others just simply weren't communicative during the pandemic, um, and that has dragged on, unfortunately. But nonetheless, we had 1,600 samples, plenty of samples to work with, frankly, and so we just got going on those. Those 1,600 samples represent 61 years of collections. So a, a quite a long span of time. So what we first did is we generated ITS barcode data. This is a, a portion of the genome whose sequence is unique to a species, at least in theory. So that's called the barcode region. And um, this is generally a good place to start when you're looking at diversity in the fungi. Um, and what we did is we then built a evolutionary tree with the ITS sequences and related sequences from other groups that we knew were related to psilocybe. And what I've done is I've color-coded the terminals on the tips of this branch that represent the sequences we generated. They came from 94 specimens. Um, there were 18 unique taxa uh, among those 94 specimens. Eight of those did not have uh, sequences in public depositories. And as you can see from this, um, the sequences in red, these are from specimens that were identified as psilocybe, but in fact belong to other genera. Species in yellow were correctly identified as psilocybe, but identified as the wrong species. And then this, the specimens in blue were correctly identified to species. So the majority of specimens were incorrectly identified. 13% um, of them didn't even belong to psilocybe at all. And then most of the ones that were correctly identified belonged to only three species. And they were psilocybe cubensis, psilocybe cyanescens, and psilocybe semilanciata. These three species are the best known species. And so it's not surprising that they are the most represented and uh, the most correctly identified, most regularly correctly identified. Okay, then we wanted to know about the chemistry. Can we find psilocybin in some of these older specimens, or does the psilocybin degrade over time? We first had to do a literature review because there was not a single source of information on the chemistry of these organisms. And so we reviewed 96 um, publicly available studies reporting chemistry of psilocybe, uh, of psilocybe species. Um, that represented only 45 of the 144 currently accepted species that are thought to be psychoactive. So quite a small number of species have ever been actually examined chemically. Um, the identification methods used in these papers were mostly not reported whatsoever. And so we have to take the name uh, that they gave and assume that they did it correctly, which is clearly from what I just showed you a bad assumption. Moreover, um, almost none of these studies does, uh, deposited voucher specimens. Um, so if they got it wrong, we'll never know because we can't go back and re-examine the material. This is really not good. <laughs> and then some of these studies even lacked peer review, um, even though the information that they provided is repeated um, throughout the history of literature on chemistry and psilocybe. So sort of in, in some, we sort of saw this as a, as a kind of a, a dumpster fire of information, or in this case, a lab fire of information. It's, it's all pretty much um, not usable. <laughs> it's very unreliably, unreliable and not usable. And so we set out to try to fill in this gap um, uh, by trying to quantify um, psilocybin and, and related metabolites in mushrooms, look at their degradation over time during storage in, in fungaria. And um, we also were interested in compounds other than psilocybin that might be present. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to tell you about the results of that today. If there's time at the end and you want to know more about that, I have the slides that I can show you. So how stable are these compounds? In, uh, in their met metabolic derivatives in museum specimens. We looked at three common species, the ones that are most represented in collections. That's Psilocybe cubensis, 
psilocybe cyanescens and psilocybe semilanceata. We then had to develop an in-house uh, method using GCMS and chemical standards that we could use to accurately determine and quantify the compounds in these mushrooms. And that's because this doesn't exist. There is no standard chemical analysis for these compounds at present. So we did this in collaboration with um, Dr. Jackie Winter, um, who is a medicinal chemist here at, at the University of Utah. And uh, some of this work was done by a rotating graduate student in my lab, Talia Bachman. So what did we find? Well, uh, in Psilocybe cubensis, this is a chart that shows you the age of the specimen going from youngest to oldest from left to right on the bottom. And on the y-axis from the bottom to the top is the concentration of the alkaloids in micrograms per milligram. And as you can see, um, virtually all of the specimens we examined, regardless of age, had almost undetectable levels of all of the compounds. There was one specimen that was 42 years old that had barely detectable levels of psilocybin. Otherwise, these, these um, specimens really don't contain these compounds. Mm -hmm. They are completely lost. That is not the case, however, for psilocybe cyanescens. Here you can see quite a bit of variability that doesn't seem to have a correlation with age, although perhaps we could start to guess there is a time component involved. But here we can see a very young specimen had very high concentrations of psilocybin, whereas a specimen that was eight years old had very low concentrations of psilocybin. And that varies, again, uh, from specimen to specimen. What we think is going on here is this has large has is largely due to the preservation of the specimen upon collection uh, and less to do with the spontaneous decay over time during storage. The same story is true of semilanciata, although the stability of the compounds seem to be a little bit more predictable in this species, although clearly at the in the specimens that are 40 plus years old, they were undetectable. And that may be due to storage um, conditions over time, or it could be that they were not preserved correctly upon um, a, a initial preservation. We simply don't know without being able to design uh, an mm -hmm. experiment to test that. But I think the take home here is that we can't rely on named specimens to predict whether or not these compounds are present. Okay, so... The take home from this part is that fungarium specimens labeled as psilocybe are frequently misidentified even to genus, and so are not reliable predictors of metabolites. Even if they are correctly identified, we can't know whether these metabolites are present at all and at what concentrations. So really, we can't use a name on a specimen to determine whether or not a controlled substance is present. More importantly, I think that these results have implications for how the specimens are stored, shared, cared for, and used in fungaria, as well as whole organism recreation and therapy, like those that are being considered in Oregon. Okay, so part two, I'm gonna move on to some phylogenomics. Uh, and I have to give you a little bit of background information here. One is how the chemical psilocybin is synthesized in the mushrooms. So it is synthesized from tryptophan, um, which is similar to serotonin in humans. And in fact, that is why it has the effect it does in our bodies when we consume it. It mimics serotonin in our brain. It um, outcompetes it at um, serotonin receptors, um, especially the sub 2A subtype. And that is why we have the effects um, that we do when we eat it. I, I want to mention also, in case you weren't aware, psilocybin itself is not the active uh, form. This is known as a prodrug. So it turns out that the phosphate group up here has to be cleaved off to form this compound here, psilocin. And this is the compound that is absorbed into the brain and has the effects. Okay, so it was recently elucidated how psilocybin was synthesized. This was just in 2017. And it turns out it uses four enzymes to, to carry out the chemical conversion from tryptophan to psilocybin. And the steps are decarboxylation to form tryptamine, 
The tryptamine is then hydroxylated at the four position to form this four hydroxy tryptamine. This seems to be the real innovation here. This, um, this chemical placement is very difficult to do synthetically. Uh, human chemists cannot do it very efficiently. So this enzyme, this, what's now known as Cyh, this is the one that really seems to be critical uh, in the biosynthesis of this compound. It then gets phosphorylated um, and then methylated twice, and that forms psilocybin, which is the stable form in the organism. Now, interestingly, in fungi, um, these pathways, the genes that encode these enzymes tend to be physically clustered in the genome. That's a very common thing in fungi. And this is an example of that here. You can see these genes are all part of a biosynthetic gene cluster or BGC. What that means is we can actually go into genomes without any prior knowledge of their secondary metabolism and scan the genomes for clusters of genes that encode enzymes that may produce compounds of interest. And then people can, in fact, express those and try to figure out what the drug is that they're making. And if there are two actually large biotech companies that have been founded in the last five years that are doing precisely this. Well, it turns out psilocybin is, is no outlier to this phenomenon. Um, and the gene cluster that encodes these four enzymes, uh, in fact, was identified. And you can see here that the four genes are very closely linked on a chromosome. Now this is, you, you'll see this figure quite a bit now going forward. Okay, so one thing that we were interested in trying to understand is whether or not there was evolutionary convergence of psilocybin biosynthesis and this is based on the observation that if you look at the phylogeny, the family tree of mushrooms that produce psilocybin, those in blue here, you can see that they don't have a single common ancestor. Um, it, they have multiple common ancestors, multiple ancestors. This is a pattern that would be consistent with convergent evolution. So um, you can imagine birds and flying insects both have wings but those wings were evolved independently. So our question was, did psilocybin biosynthesis evolve independently or is there a single common origin? One group published uh, in 2018 on some of this and, and demonstrated that um, in fact, the psilocybin biosynthetic gene cluster has evolved convergently through horizontal gene transfer at least twice in these mushrooms. They did this by sequencing genomes of these three species and then showed through phylog phylogenetic analysis of one of the, uh, the biosynthetic genes that in fact, the species were more closely re related to each other than they are on the species tree. This is expected if the genes got moved between organisms, across organisms, organisms, because then the genes would be more closely related to each other than the organisms are to each other. And that's precisely the pattern that they showed. Now the gene cluster here, this is the pattern of the genes that you saw previously, you can see across these species, it's very consistent. And this is also an indication that they share um, a very close relationship. The, gene, the genes themselves share a close relationship. You can see there's a bit of a rearrangement in this species, but by and large, the cluster is retained. Okay, but there were some other species that produced psilocybin that hadn't been included in the study. And so we were kind of interested in including these other two for two reasons. One is this species is the most evolutionarily distant psilocybin producing mushroom. You can see here, this is quite um, distantly related to the rest of them. So we were really curious if this might have a different gene cluster. And then we also wanted to include this species here, Inosibi corridolina, because it has a very different ecology. So the previous study had suggested that the horizontal gene transfer was facilitated by shared habitat through shared ecologies because all of these are decomposers found on wood or dung or rich soil. 
And so perhaps it was just through close contact that they were able to exchange those genes. Mm -hmm. This one is an, a mycorrhizal species. So this is an obligate symbiont of plants. It lives on the roots of plants and occupies a fundamentally different ecological niche than the rest of them. So we set out to sequence these, uh, the genomes of these two and look for the gene cluster. Um, and just to remind you, this is what the gene cluster from all of the other ones look, looks like. And we found essentially the same cluster in Pluteus salicinus the most distantly related species. So it looks like this is yet another horizontal transfer event. However, perhaps more interestingly, we did not find the same gene cluster in this species. We did, however, find a cluster that encodes enzymes that appear to perform the same catalytic functions as the ones in the psilocybin biosynthetic gene cluster. So we think we've found an example of evolutionary convergence where they have independently evolved the biosynthetic capacity to synthesize psilocybin. And this is reinforced by looking at the gene tree of one of the genes, the PsiD gene in the gene cluster. And you can see that all of the other species, including Pluteus salicinus here, all cluster together, but the gene that we think is performing that function in inosibi is very distantly related. So we think we found an example of convergent evolution, which is quite remarkable. So not only has this chemical been preserved through horizontal gene transfer, but it's also evolved independently. All of this points to this compound being very important to the, the function of the organism. It must be providing uh, something very important to the organism. Okay, so the take homes from this part, are that um, we now know the genetic basis of bio psilocybin biosynthesis in psilocybe. Uh, the most distantly related uh, mushrooms have acquired the gene cluster through a horizontal gene transfer. And in one group, we think that it has evolved the ability to synthesize psilocybin convergently. Okay. So, <clears throat> What we wanted to know, though, was how has psilocybin biosynthesis evolved within psilocybe? So we've been talking about species outside of psilocybe for the most part. We wanted to know more about within psilocybe because it's the largest group. This was a current understanding of psilocybe phylogeny back in 2013. Uh, to this day, this is the most comprehensive phylogeny we have. Interestingly, the species whose um, genomes have been sequenced and that we know that we understand the psilocybin biosynthetic cluster from are all from this clade two. So they're all actually fairly closely related. Here's psilocybe cubensis in clade two. However, other species like psilocybe zapotacorum from clade one, where most of the diversity of psilocybe resides, we don't have any information about the biosynthetic gene cluster from these species. So we identified some gaps, which was that the current phylogeny was based only on 22 species of psilocybe, represented by only three types. Uh, these are specimens that are designated at the time a species is described and are really the only physical material that carries that name. All other modern material that are identified with that name are really just hypotheses. And so if we want to be able to accurately um, uh, and consistently apply names to new things that we collect, we have to know how they relate to the types. And we have, and today we rely heavily on DNA sequencing for that, which is why I'm emphasizing the fact that only three of the types, uh, sorry, only three of these species have DNA sequences from type specimens. Okay, also this phylogeny was based only on three gene regions. And what that means uh, in this case is that some of the relationships like up here, are not well supported by the data. And so it, it, um, uh, it, it produces some ambiguity about relationships, which makes it difficult then for us to go and, and understand evolutionary patterns. So we saw these gaps and we said, well, why don't we just sequence whole genomes for everything? <laughs> and uh, Paul said, yes. So we got started on it. <clears throat> 
And some institutions like Q don't loan their specimens out. And so we had to travel there to sample them. This is Alex holding the holotype specimen of Psilocybe cyanescens uh, described in the early 20th century from the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. Now, there are some challenges we face when we're trying to make use of this old material. And that is, um, there's, there's a number of problems that we face. One is that often the material is very scant. There's very little of it, and it's in poor condition. And that means they'll likely yield very low quantities of very poor quality DNA. That DNA can be damaged, so it can be highly fragmented, meaning it can occur in very short fragments, uh, about 50 base pairs on average. We can also have this phenomenon of spontaneous cytosine to uracil conversion. This is a spontaneous process where um, uh, when that uh, conversion occurs, the cytosines get converted to, to uracil. That gets read by the sequencing um, instrument as a thymine. And what this, what this means is you can actually get an artificial bias of thymine. That's the red here. Um, at the ends of the fragments. And if you don't account for that, that can lead to um, incorrect conclusions on downstream analyses. So you have to account for that lesioning. And then finally, a lot of these um, have lots of other organisms on them that have been growing on them since they've been in storage, like molds, uh, sometimes insects or other things. And in, in many cases, the DNA that you're interested in, the target DNA, um, in fact, rep is represented by a very small proportion of the DNA in the sample. So all of this put together creates a really difficult situation when you're dealing with old specimens like this. However, we have been able to successfully generate genomes from very old fungal specimens. The oldest uh, was collected in 1849 by Hooker uh, on his trip to India, to Sikkim, India. Um, and we have a full genome now from a specimen he collected and 1849. This is the type of uh, Strophyria cubensis, now known as Psilocybe cubensis. And it turns out that no one had generated DNA sequence from this type, even though this is arguably the most important species of Psilocybe today. It's the most widely cultivated species, certainly. And so we asked for the type and we were able to generate a whole genome from it. So this is what it looks like. One thing I'll point out here is here you can see on the uh, specimen, this white, this is a mold that you often find on really old specimens. Um, and this can be a real problem for us because the DNA of the mold tends to be in a lot better shape than the DNA of the target specimen. And that can really lead you astray if you aren't careful. So what I'm showing you is a, um, a plot. This is called a blob plot for, for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, and we can classify this. So these are the DNA sequences after we've stitched them together. And the colors represent the different taxa that we found in the DNA sample from this specimen. So I don't know if you can read this very well, but this is at the kingdom level. So you, we can see this blue, all this blue here, that's all bacteria. Uh, the red here is all metazoa, animals. Uh, purple, Virta planti, so green plants. <laughs> Some other things that aren't quite clear what they are. A lot of stuff in the gray are, are things that couldn't be identified. Um, the orange is uh, what's identified as fungus. So you can see that the fungal DNA here is quite a small proportion of the total DNA. If we zoom in to the rank of genus, the colors changed, but the blue here, which was red in the last one, if you can see that, it says the genus Homo. <laughs> that means it's human. So we got a lot of human DNA um, out of this specimen. Now, maybe we have um, DNA from Gaston Guzman in here. That would be interesting to know. Um, but we haven't we haven't pursued that yet. So. Um, this is really just to illustrate the, the difficulties that we face with, with data like this. Now, we can actually make sense out of it. So what we do, um, and this is just a very general overview, is we can go into those um, messy um, 
messy DNA sequences and we can pull out, we can fish out of there genes that are, whoops, genes that are known as universal single copy orthologs. So these are genes that match a database of genes that are found across a wide variety of taxa. So these tend to be really good genes for inferring relationships because they're found in lots of things. They tend to be really highly conserved um, and do, are not undergoing um, uh, selection. So they probably give an honest signal of relationships. So that's what we did. We went in and, and fished these out of those um, slurries of sequences. This is kind of the approach we took, um, just for those of you that are interested. Um, this is the shotgun sequencing. We then do this ortholog extraction from the from the Busco data set and, and, and stitch them together so we have homologous comparisons. And then we infer phylogenies from those. And this data set for psilocybe, we were able to preserve almost 3,000 genes from these um, universal single copy orthologs. So that's a lot of data to work with. And that is really good for us because it means that we can really um, make robust conclusions. So the method, the approach that we take um, is a little different than traditional phylogenetic methods. Um, and I won't go into details or explain exactly why we do this, but if you're interested, please do ask. But basically what we do is we build gene, we build trees for every gene individually. So gene one, two, three, all the way down to 2,983, we've got trees for every one of those genes. We can then um, superimpose those like this. And from that, we can extract the topology. So the relationships of the species that is um, most consistent with all of the gene trees. This is an approach that's known as summary coalescence. And this is what a lot of phylogenetic, um, modern phylogenomic uh, analyses um, utilize now. Okay, so this is the tree that we generated using that approach. And I don't expect you to be able to read all of these things, but um, in summary, we got 71 genomes so far. We actually have a lot more in the pipeline, but we haven't been able to analyze them um, yet. It takes a long time to do these analyses. And they represent 67 species. 52 of these turned out to be in psilocybe sensu stricto, the group that should contain all the bluing species, all the psychoactive species. 16 of them were instead um, belonged to the genus Deconica, the non-hallucinogenic genus. An additional three species we found were not in Deconica, but also not in Psilocybe. And we don't know what genus they belong to yet, but they were clearly falling outside of both of those groups. Importantly, we now have um, strong statistical support for every single node in the tree. So we can now, we now know that these relationships are very robustly supported. And that allows us now to really examine patterns of evolution. The other thing we were able to do is figure out how old these groups are. So we did a time calibration analysis. And it, this suggests with a lot of, um, of a lot of error here, but it suggests that psilocybe originated around 65 million years ago um, and began to diversify 53 million years ago. Now, these dates are important, as you'll hear in a minute when I start to speculate on some of the function of psilocybin. So keep these in mind, but I will remind you, remind you when we get there. Okay, so compared to the 2013 study, which was up to this point the best um, phylogeny for psilocybe, we've now expanded that greatly. So we've more than doubled the number of species. Uh, many of those are now within clade one up here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that this is the most diverse group. So we now have many more uh, representatives that we can examine. And by and large, the relationships that were recovered in 2013 were recovered again with a few changes. So for example, in 2013, this Cortospori group was um, closely related to the Mexicani group and Zapotecorum group was next to them. But in our tree, we have a slight sh shift. So the Cortospori group, in fact, is more closely related to the Zapotecorum group than it is to the Mexicani group. And the 
Um, back in 2013, that relationship was not well supported. And in our analysis, it's now fully supported with 100% statistical support. So that's the kind of improvement we can get with data sets like this. Okay, so we're really interested in this biosynthetic gene cluster. And we wanted to know now that we have expanded sampling and whole genomes that we can mine for the biosynthetic gene clusters, if we can find these in all of the genomes and look at patterns of evolution across the phylogeny. So we did that. And you can see uh, from the clade two that this gene cluster is essentially unchanged across uh, the species. So it's consistent that we have this order of the genes in the cluster. However, that's not the case for clade one. And remember, there were no genomes from clade one um, known. So this wasn't possible to infer. So I'm trying to move this out of my way. I don't know if you can see that, but it's getting in my way. Um, you can see that the order of the genes is different, in it, but consistently different across all of the species in clade one. So instead of having psi M gene after psi D, here we have the psi K gene after psi D. Now we don't know why this is, but clearly, there's a lot more to explore in the evolution of the psilocybin biosynthetic gene cluster than we could previously appreciate. The other thing I'll mention here is the Psi H gene. Um, that's the purple gene. You'll notice that there are cases where there's two genes in the gene cluster, and this has happened throughout the groups. So the Psi H gene seems to have been duplicated many times over the evolutionary history of psilocybe. Again, we don't know what the significance of that is, um, but we didn't know it was there until now. Okay, so they, these are the take-homes of uh, this analysis. So the clade one has a different order in the gene cluster, and the psi H has been duplicated many times. Okay, now I'm moving on to speculations. So the, the context here is um, it's long been known that plants produce secondary metabolites as defenses against herbivorous insects. And here's a great quote that from Dan Jansen um, illustrating this. And I highlight here, um, he, he actually cited aflatoxin in his um, kind of famous quote about how the world is not green uh, to an insect. Um, and aflatoxin, if you don't know, is actually a fungal secondary metabolite. So I thought it was quite uh, prescient of Dan Jansen that, in fact, he was really already thinking about fungi without thinking about fungi. <clears throat> so the question then, of course, is could psilocybin function as a defense against mycophagy? Now, um, there's it, if it is, then it must have an effect on the organism that consumes it. And there's virtually no information out there on it except for um, bioassays in humans. <laughs> um, but some people attempted to study this back in the 60s before Nixon shut down all research on psilocybin. And this is the one study I could find where they gave spiders an oral psilocybin dose at 150 milligrams per kilo. Now that is about 300 times the dose used in human therapy, therapy sessions. So just bear that in mind. This is a massive dose of psilocybin to the spider. And surprisingly, that spider can build a pretty darn good web. <laughs> now, <laughs> they, they saw that it had fewer radii and spiral turns and shorter threads. And so they thought that this was evidence that these spiders, in fact, were being impacted by psilocybin but I, I would beg to differ. Okay, the only other study really that's relevant um, didn't involve psilocybin, but it did involve a related compound, LSD. Um, and they fed LSD to fruit flies, and then they put the fruit fly in this contraption where this cylinder spins, it's got this black band. The cylinder bit spins around, and then the fruit fly um, orients itself based on the pattern of the, of the um, black band across its. Um, across its eye. And they were able to show that when you give 
flies LSD that this really messes up their ability to orient themselves. Um, and that's that's here in this um, uh, this chart on the right, this bar chart. So this is LSD here. You can see their optomotor score was uh, really crashed from the from the non LSD flies. Um, and interestingly, they were able to recover the behavior, uh, the optomotor score by blocking um, LSD's action against serotonin receptors. So that's what this is showing. And so it, this is relevant because we know that psilocybin is really quite selective for serotonin subtype 2A receptors. And this is showing that those types of receptors are involved in real behavior in flies. Okay, now one observation we made uh, early on was that actually psilocybin mushrooms in nature um, are regularly filled with fly larvae. <laughs> And that is sort of um, counterintuitive if it's really functioning as a defense agent against mycophagous insects. Here is another one of those blob plots that I showed previously. And I've circled here DNA that is assigned to diptera. And in fact, we were able to fish out the DNA and identify it. And it belongs to this, this uh, fungus gnat. Um, this happens to be a really common generalist mycophagous fly. Now, I emphasize that it's my generalist because it's conceivable that individual species might evolve a specialized tolerance to psilocybe because that opens up a new resource to them. However, this fly is not specialized whatsoever on psilocybe. You can find it on, in virtually every mushroom in nature. So that strongly suggests that psilocybe is, psilocybin is not effective as a defense against at least this fly and likely many other flies. We wanted to take this a step further because it's one thing to lay your eggs and have larvae develop. It's quite another for those larvae to reach adulthood. And so we did a rearing experiment where we found psilocybin, psilocybe cyanescens mushrooms and co-occurring stropharia aeruginosa uh, mushrooms. And we collected them and then put them in jars and reared insects from them. And after uh, one to two weeks, we actually got adult flies out of both of them, and they were the same fly belonging to the family Cyaridae. So this is, again, further evidence that at least some insects can develop to adulthood in psilocybin-producing mushrooms. So I have another idea. Maybe it's not insects. Maybe it is gastropods. Here you can see a, a pluteus, a poor pluteus mushroom that is being decimated by some slugs. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> remember I mentioned these dates. So we've been able to reconstruct that psilocybin biosynthesis evolved first in psilocybe, and that it has transferred uh, multiple times to the other genera um, during, four, during the period of time 40 to 22 million years ago. The most recent um, is potentially a, a horizontal transfer from Pluteus to Gymnopolis about 7 million years ago. Now, interestingly, the terrestrial gastropods first colonized land around this time as well. So they became particularly common in the Paleogene 66 to 23 million years ago. Remember, that's exactly the date where we see psilocybin biosynthesis evolving and being moving between species. So this is really nice correlation, but of course, correlation is not causation. However, there's some other lines of evidence here that I think reinforce this idea. One is that mushrooms do have inducible chemical defenses. Um, a good example of this is the most common volatile compound that we all recognize as mushroom smell, mushroom scent. Um, this has been shown to behaviorally um, cause banana slugs to stop feeding. And it is something that is um, in, uh, <clears throat> expressed when cells are damaged during feeding. Now, psilocybe also has an inducible reaction. Remember this bluing that I've been talking about? This is what it looks like. When you damage the tissue, it turns blue. It turns out that that blue, the chemistry of that was recently elucidated. And the, the basis of the blue pigment is in fact psilocin molecules that are then linked together into chains. So you get these chains of psilocin molecules. That is 
um, produces a chromophore, which is giving the blue color. And importantly, um, this, uh, this reaction is catalyzed enzymatically. So it's not spontaneous, but requires an enzyme to do the linking. And that enzyme is kept physically separated from psilocybin and psilocin um, in a healthy cell. So it's only upon damage that the enzyme then can convert the psilocin into the chains. And the chemical properties of this of these um, chains of psilocin are very similar to polyphenolic tannins. And, it's, and these are chemical defenses in plants that are known to cause um, reactive oxygen molecules that cause uh, lesioning. It burns the guts of insects when they eat them. So this suggests, although of course this is not proven yet, that the pigment, the blue pigment that is formed um, can provide a protective effect uh, through this oxidative, uh, sorry, through this um, oxi reactive oxygen generation. Now, interestingly, in both the horizontal transfer events and the putative uh, convergent evolution of psilocybin biosynthesis, the capacity to form those blue uh, pigments, the, the psilocin oligomers, is preserved. So that suggests that the blue, in fact, is an important component of whatever function this is um, providing in nature. And so I have an alternative hypothesis to why psilocybin evolved. It's not directly involved, I don't think, in defense, but in fact, is just a precursor to the real defense against slugs and snails. And so that's my hypothesis, that it's really the blue pigment that's performing the functional defense and that the psychoactivity of psilocybin and psilocin in humans is really just a happy accident. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you for sticking with me for so long. Uh, if there's time, I'd love to take some questions. Thank you, Bryn. I'm, I'm not gonna reorient this, but I, are there any questions? Yeah, there's one. Yeah, uh, if Bryn feels comfortable, if you could tell us a little bit about the, one of the nine discoveries was in London. And I was wondering, if you, would you feel comfortable sharing that story with us about how you found that in London? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Could you repeat it? Sure. Uh, of the nine philosophy that you actually oh. encountered yourself, one of them was in London, and that really stood out. And I was wondering if it were possible for you to share that story. Sure, yeah. So um, I'll throw up the slide here. Yeah, this right here, Psilocybe cyanescens, um, is actually one of the most common mushrooms uh, around Kew Gardens. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, around this time of year, in fact. So um, this, is a, this lives on wood chips. And uh, of course, wood chips are used extensively in landscaping uh, in lots of places, not just at Kew. But uh, it appears from the maps that we have of the records of this species in the UK that Q actually is the center of origin of this species um, and that it's slowly spread out from London and, and is getting um, distributed more widely on the island. But this species was des described from Q in the early 20th century by Elsie Wakefield, one of the early um, heads of mycology there. Um, and uh, it grows also within the greenhouses. In fact, it's, it was quite a common denizen of the temperate house, if you're familiar with Kew, um, which I learned from uh, many of the gardeners that would tend the temperate house. <laughs> they were the ones that knew about it. Thank you. Great. Yep. There's one, yeah. Um, so the first time that I found um, Gymnopolis, I actually saw a pair of slugs that appeared to have died after eating mushrooms. So I'm Ooh. really interested to see if uh, you will have any plans to follow up with your uh, slug related hypothesis by uh, actually feeding experiments or anything like that. That's a fascinating anecdote. And thank you for sharing because I've asked and I've given lectures on this in, um, to, to large numbers of people. And I, I've asked people to please let me know if they have ever seen a slug or a snail eating a psilocybin mushroom. Uh, nobody ha has ever provided any anecdote of it. So this is, this is great to hear that anecdote. Um, and in fact, yes, we do have a plan 
Uh, we will probably be doing this experiment next semester where we're going to feed some slugs and snails, psilocybin, and some other things to try to determine if this has a real impact. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Bryn. Uh, we all appreciated this, and it was a great afternoon for us. So thank you. Thank you. And I, I will just say there are a few of you that may want to have a maybe brief introduction to the herbarium who weren't on the tour. Uh, let me know, come up afterwards, and I'll take you around a bit. And there's candy and cookies up here. So please help yourself. Thank you. We thank you for keeping the communications on, keeping us on the ball. That's what gets us. Without a person, I just want to tell you, it's hard to do. That's why we're here today. Oh, my God.